Welcome to chapter 12 of the Pastor's Guide to Leading and Living. And in this session, we want to talk about the pastor and his passage. By that, I mean the passage into the gospel ministry, which is through the door of ordination. Being ordained to the gospel ministry, and particularly in this session, being ordained to the ministry of the deacon. You who are pastors and church workers who are listening to this have already been ordained to the gospel ministry. And you can learn more about that in that chapter of why we do it and how we do it in in the pastor's guide. What I want to emphasize in this session is the ordination of the deacon, because it's a vital ministry that the pastor is involved with. In fact, the ministry of the pulpit and the pew, the pastor and the people, joined together is such a vital ministry. And and the pastor should have no more greater loyal supporters and partners in ministry, fellow workers, as we read in the New Testament, synergos, this synergistic thing that comes into play than the pastor and his deacons. Dr. W.A. Crystal, one of my great mentors, always said that the pastor and the deacons were like a, a pair of scissors. He said, neither cuts like it could without the other. Neither one of those edges of those scissors cut like it could without the other. We can take a pair of scissors if they're not together and and take one of them and we can cut some with it, but it's difficult and jagged. But you take a pair of scissors and you get them together and use both edges and it cuts so wonderfully well. And, And he likened this ministry of the pastor and this ordination of the deacon and the ministry of the deacon together, joined together like a pair of scissors. Uh, neither edge cuts like it could without the other, but put together, it's an incredible thing. You know, the word deacon, the in the in the New Testament, is translated at least 30 times in the New Testament. Three of those times, it's translated deacon. The other 27 times, it's translated servant or or, or, or minister. In fact, the word dia through, and, and it, it comes through, through the words through the dust. And the very, the very word speaks of a foot washer. That's what a deacon is. In fact, if it, we'd been in a first century world today and we go to a banquet at somebody's home, we wouldn't have gotten in our cars and driven there. Of course, we'd have walked over those dusty, dirty Judean roads in our sandals. By the time we got there, our feet would be dirty and there would be somebody at the door that the host would have there seated uh, by the door on his knees with a basin of water and a towel. And we came in, he would take off our sandals and he would wash our feet and we'd come into the banquet. And if we were standing around in the banquet talking about that man back over there at the door, he would be called a diakonos, the very word from which we get our word deacon. There to be foot washers. There to be servants in the church. Their very word ministers to that. You know, the history of the deacon, <clears throat> we find in Acts, nine, Acts chapter uh, 2, 5, and particularly in Acts chapter 6, but in Acts chapter 2, the church exploded and was birthed. 3,000 were saved and baptized that day. Then the, we read that the Bible says that 5,000 were saved, and then it began to multiply. Thousands of people were coming to Christ. By the time we get to Acts chapter 6, we read that the the city of Jerusalem had already been filled with the doctrine of Christ, and thousands and thousands of people had been saved and made up that early church. And we get to chapter 6, and the first dissension comes into the church because there were two groups of Jews. In fact, as you know, it was a Jewish phenomenon. Everybody that was saved were Jews. There were those Hebraic Jews, the old conservative ones who lived in Jerusalem, and were Hebraic, but there were also a group of Hellenistic Jews from the Greek-speaking world. Remember, they had come for the Passover. They'd come for the Jewish feast, and they had been by the thousands in Jerusalem away from home, and they heard Peter's message, and they were saved, and they stayed there in Jerusalem, these Hellenistic, more cosmopolitan Jews. And these Hebraics and the, and, the, and the Hellenistic both made up the early church. And we get to Acts 6, and we find dissension comes. Because the Hellenists thought that they were being overlooked and that Peter and those Hebraic apostles were slighting the Hellenists and overlooking them in what they called the daily distribution of food and the ministry to the widows. People were away from home. They didn't have food and they were, they were sharing what they had. And, and those Hellenists thought they were getting ripped off by Peter and the, the others who were showing favoritism to their own group. 
And so that's when they used some real spiritual common sense. And God initiated the ministry and the office of the deacon. And Peter and the apostles appointed seven deacons. And one of the most beautiful things you see in Scripture, when those seven are named, they all have Hellenistic names, Greek names. They appointed all seven of these deacons out of that group that thought they were being slighted. And those who who the first deacons were. So the deacon was given to the church primarily to solve conflict and to be peacemakers and to serve the people like foot washers and servants, and to bring unity and love to the church and to the family of God. That's the very reason for the existence of the deacon. They weren't some board that was there to pass and make all the decisions. They were servants there to maintain the unity of the fellowship in the bond of peace. So when you minister in your passage, this deacon ordination, there, there are several things that we want to talk about in Acts 6 that are vitally important. First of all, it's instigation. What instigated it? I've just talked about that. It began at the platform of a problem. The reason we have deacons in the church was because a problem came and it was dissension and people thought they were being slighted and a tear in the fellowship came and the very deacons were instigated to keep unity. That's their primary purpose. In your church, in my church, in every church, they're there primarily because they are there to keep the unity of the family of faith in love and unity with each other. That's their instigation. Then secondly, we see their initiation. How did they become a deacon? Well, they were, they were men of good reputation. They had to be full of the Holy Spirit. They had to be full of faith. But there's an interesting thing. The Bible says, pick you out seven men among you there. And there are different words we translate, as you know, men in the New Testament. One is Adelphos. It's generic. When we read that word, it means the people. Men and women and boys and girls, the, the people. But there's another one, Andros, or the noun form Andron, the plural form. It, it means male. It, it's translated husband. It, it, it means a man, a male, a husband. And that's the word we find in Acts 6. When God tells them to pick out seven males, men, husbands among you. And they picked out seven, and they're all men with those Hellenistic names as I mentioned. I don't want to make a big deal of this, but it's a biblical principle that they're to be men. It's no question about it in the Word of God. They were all men who were appointed in the Word of God. And the very Greek word tells us they were men. So many times cultural issues and cultural things emerge into the church, but there comes a time when we have to decide whether we're going to let culture dictate us or what the Word of God really says. So their instigation, their initiation, what about their integration? How were they to integrate this ministry into the... They were to serve tables. They were to wait on people. They were to do the, wait, the, the, the service ministries of the church. To be Christ's hand extended in serving and washing feet and serving tables. Why? The Bible says so that those apostles could devote themselves. So that you, pastor, could devote yourself to two things. The ministry of the Word and to prayer. And so the deacon is the gift of God to the pastor and to the church so that the pastor can spend his time getting ready to rightly divide the Word of God, the ministry of the Word, and to devote himself to prayer for the church so that those become his priorities while so many of these service organizations and service ministries are performed by the work of this special gift of the church, the deacon. And then finally, not just the instigation and the initiation and the integration, but the inspiration, the inspiration. You know what it says? It says it pleased the whole multitude. Secondly, it says the word of God spread. And thirdly, it says the number of disciples grew greatly. Three things happen when, as Dr. Crystal said, the pastor and the, and the deacons work together like that pair of scissors. It pleased the whole multitude. People come together in love and unity, and they're happy, and they're pleased, and they're filled with each other's love and unity as it's shared with each other. Secondly, the Word of God spread. They filled Jerusalem with the doctrine of the Word of God. And the number of disciples grew greatly. Their evangelism exploded as more and more people came to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what happens when the pastor and the deacon who's ordained 
come to this unity and this love and see why they're there and what their instigation is and what their integration is and can see their inspiration that, that your church will live together in love and unity and you'll fill your city with the Word of God and people will be saved because of that. You know, I've always said that love and unity is the greatest factor in church growth. And that's why the pastor said in Ephesians, uh, the, the, the Paul said in Ephesians 4 that the pastor's primary job is to maintain the bond of peace in the spirit of love, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Go forth and do that because love and unity are the greatest factors of church growth.